In the 1950s and early 60s, anthology shows, where there were new characters and new stories every week, were all over television. For the fall of 1960, NBC gave the TV executive Hubble Robinson a full hour of prime time to do any type of show he wanted. And he had always wanted to do a suspenseful anthology show called Thriller. He hired Fletcher Markle to produce it, an aging horror legend, Boris Karloff, to be the host. The show premiered on September 13, 1960, with bad ratings and bad reviews. The stories were crime dramas, like badly done versions of what the Alfred Hitchcock show was doing. After eight episodes, Fletcher Markle drove on to the Universal Studios lot and discovered that there was a new name on this parking spot, and that's how he found out he was fired. Two new producers, Bill Fry and Maxwell Shane, were brought in. Having Boris Karloff, Frankenstein himself, as the host, NBC wanted stories who went with his horror star persona. And since Bill Fry had liked horror movies as a kid, that was the direction he went in. Shane was still doing crime episodes and was quickly fired too, leaving Bill Fry as the main creative force. Fry used stories from Weird Tales magazine as the basis for many of the episodes. He used directors like Ida Lupino, writers like Robert Block, and composers like Jerry Goldsmith. There was a thriller board game, a comic book, and Stephen King said that Thriller was probably the best horror series ever put on TV. Thriller did 67 episodes in two seasons. And as sure as my name is Boris Karloff, here are the top 10 best ones. Hello, operator. Would you get me Boris Karloff, please? Well, so what if he's dead? at and isn't what it used to be. Well, anyway, our number 10 episode is Dialogues with Death. This episode contains two stories. The first story is about a morgue attendant, Pop Jenkins, who can communicate with corpses. The second story is about Colonel Jackson Beauregard Finches and Aunt Emily, who believe their very much alive nephew is actually dead. Boris Karloff only acts in five episodes of Thriller. He was in his 70s, he had a very bad back as a direct result of playing the monster in Frankenstein, so they didn't want to wear him out. But he was always game. And this episode is a Boris Karloff showcase, where he plays three roles. As always, he's the host with the most. They film him with plenty of shadows, so he looks spooky. But he also has this grandfatherly warmth and this twinkle in his eye whenever he's making dark humor jokes. Being the proper English gentleman, he formally introduces the cast. And I always love it when he introduces himself. In the first story, Boris brings this quiet sensitivity to Pop Jenkins. You get to appreciate his voice with that little lisp, and he makes it a touching little story. Now the second story is my favorite, and it's an homage to Boris Karloff's Broadway play Arsenic and Old Lace, the dark comedy about two crazy old ants who poison people with elderberry wine. Here, it's a crazy aunt and uncle, and Estelle Winwood and Boris Karloff are perfect at this tongue-in-cheek humor, and they even reference that famous elderberry wine. Ah, oh, that's Daniel's great-grandmother Susan! A most high-spirited lady, that one. Dispatched a carpetbagger with her own hands. Poisoned him with elderberry wine. Both stories are good on their own, but Boris's charm and versatility make them even better. There are many evil things in this world, including some of my best friends. But there are few things as evil as the topic and title of our number nine episode, La Strega. In 18th century Italy, Tonio tries to protect his love, Luana, from her grandmother, whom happens to be a witch, or an Italian, La Strega. This episode is terrifying, and what makes it is Jeanette Nolan as the La Strega. Her makeup and outfit make her look like a witch out of the original versions of Grimm's Fairy Tales, you know, back when they were violent and groovy. And it's not so much her lines, but her facial expressions and her eyes that make her so eerie, because it seems like no matter what you're trying to hide from her, she already knows it. 
My favorite scene is when Luana is in Tonio's apartment, and she's convinced that her grandmother's coming for her. And to prove that she's not, Tonio has her look out the window. I'm going to show you there is no one on the street but the old beggar, who always makes his bed at this time. Come here, Luana, you have to look. That glance is one of the scariest things I've ever seen because you know she knows Luana's there and it's the suspense of what is she going to do. And when she gets to that room, it's just as creepy as you imagined. Ah, my favorite blend. Arsenic. Now our number eight episode is The Poisoner. The aristocratic critic? Author, writer, and dandy, Thomas Edward Griffith is in debt. He assumed his new wife was rich. Unfortunately, she's not. So he poisons his in-laws and his uncle for the inheritance. This is one of the crime-based episodes. Which usually aren't a bang. But what makes this one a classic is the murderer himself, Thomas Edward Griffith, is played by Murray Matheson. As Boris Karloff points out in the opening, he's actually based on the real-life suspected murderer, Thomas Griffith Wainwright. Now, they changed some things around, but even if he was proven innocent, he's still a fascinating character to learn about. Plus, Murray Matheson is so funny in this role. He's this fabulous snob, and he's shocked and disgusted to find out that his in-laws aren't rich. But the way they're presented, you're actually on his side. I feel sick in my stomach. You're not even rich. No matter if he's killing someone, sitting in jail, or hitting his wife's cat, he always has this style and flair, and you can't wait to see what horrible thing he's going to do or say next. Plus, this episode's educational. You learn how to kill your mother-in-law. <coughs> Don't be alarmed by the woman's scream. She's quiet now. And as sure as my name is Boris Karloff, that brings us to our number seven episode, The Howl Watcher. And this is a thriller. An Irish mail order bride named Meg marries Hugo Wheeler, who lives in the town of Black Hollow, North Carolina. She kills his father and is plotting to steal Hugo's money. Unfortunately for her, in the town of Black Hollow, the Hollow Watcher punishes such misdeeds. This episode has a groovy setting and a groovy monster. In the 1960s, rural and western shows were all over television. The Andy Griffith Show, Gunsmoke, The Rifleman, Green Acres, Petticoat Junction, you name them. And if you've seen any of these shows, the town of Black Hollow seems so familiar. The general store set looks right out of Petticoat Junction. And the character actors that populate this town appeared in all those shows. And I was watching, I was going, hey, that's Wally from Andy Griffith. And hey, that's Ralph from Green Acres. So it has that same country charm. And you feel right at home. So when the Hollow Watcher comes, it's more shocking. Because this cozy environment suddenly becomes deadly. Everyone in town believes this myth. And there are great shots of him standing still, creating this spooky atmosphere. As for his appearance, he does look a little goofy, and he moves clumsily, but it makes it seem like a real scarecrow come to life, as opposed to a monster scarecrow. During his first attack, this clumsiness works because you're not supposed to know if it's a monster or a person. During the second attack, this clumsiness actually makes it more dissettling, because you see this goofy thing juxtaposed with the violence. He's relentless, like a predecessor to Michael Myers or Jason. It's an ordinary town, and an ordinary scarecrow 
suddenly becoming your worst nightmare. Ah, uh, these are my new glasses, or should I say, The Cheetahs, which happens to be the title of a number six episode. And as sure as my name is Boris Karloff, this is a thriller. Dick Van Prynne invents a pair of glasses that allows a person to see or hear the truth in himself or others. I have no idea what I'm talking about. He hangs himself, but the glasses go through four other owners with equally macabre results. This is the 15th episode of Thriller. And while they had done a spooky episode before this, The Purple Room, which was aired around Halloween, The Cheaters is usually considered the first classic episode, where they finally figure out their formula. Up until this point, Boris Karloff has only been saying variations of his famous catchphrase. But here, he finally utters the exact words, It shows my name is Boris Karloff, this is a thriller. He barely ever says it, but it's so memorable you think he says it in every episode. And it's something that only a horror icon of his stature could say. And he makes good on his word. This is the first all-out supernatural story. It's the first story from Weird Tales magazine. And it's a Robert Block story, so it's his first episode too. And it's the first episode with a Jerry Goldsmith score. It lays the groundwork for all the great episodes that come after it. And it's a great episode in its own right. For modern audiences, Hey, who's that, Frankie Mary? Our anthology shows from this era can seem a little slow, because you're waiting a whole hour for the scary climax. But because this pair of cheaters goes to five different characters, you actually get five little stories within the hour, and five scary climaxes. I love the way the cheaters work, too. When you have them on and are looking at someone else, you can hear their thoughts, and there's this running gag that they're always thinking something mean, then they say something nice using similar words. I've been fitted for some new glasses. Very unusual. The perfect touch for that Halloween costume the old bat is wearing. The perfect touch for that custom look that everyone's wearing. It's like Eddie Haskell on steroids. It's so funny. And it brings extra life while you're waiting for the scary moments. Say, that chap looks familiar. Of course, he's not a real vampire. Real vampires wear pearls. Now before you go bats, our number five episode is Masquerade. Honeymooners Charlie and Ross Denham spend the night in a spooky house with a trio of horrifying hillbillies, the Carters. Jed Carter tries to scare the Denhams by telling them the legend of the Henshaw Vampire Curse. But in a twist ending, it's revealed that the Denhams are actually the vampires. Like the best horror comedies, it creates an authentic horror atmosphere. It's set on a rainy night, and the house used for the exterior shots is actually the Psycho House. Psycho had just come out a year before, so the house was just conveniently there on the Universal back lot. They use it in a couple other episodes too, and it creates such a mood, and is like a celebrity cameo in and of itself. Boris's introduction is extra spooky and extra campy, with a fake bat and an ominous warning to the audience. And while the hillbilly family is funny, they're also threatening because they plan on eating the denims, like an early version of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre family. Don't pay any attention to her, mister. She always gets a little lightheaded when she's missed a meal. <laughs> so do I. Do you intend on eating us? We don't eat visitors, we just kill them and steal their money. Most of the comedy comes from the witty banter between Charlie and Ross, and the response to what's going on around them. And along with this biting humor, I also love the Transylvanian twist. John Carradine, who is both creepy and hysterical as Jed Carter, was a horror star in his own right, and had played Count Dracula twice before this episode, and two more times afterwards. So you're set up to think that him and his family are the vampires. But instead, it's Tom Poston and the beautiful, adorable, and hysterical Elizabeth Montgomery. Now, a few years later, Elizabeth played the beautiful girl who's secretly a witch on Bewitched. So it turns out to be on the nose casting, because it's no longer the old-fashioned John Carradine monster, but the new, sophisticated, and posh modern monster. Ah, uh, I love looking at my own reflection. But some love it too much, 
such as in our number four episode, The Hungry Glass. Gil Thrasher and his wife Marcia move into a house by the sea. Unfortunately, it's haunted by a spirit that lives in the mirrors. This episode is like a combination of the horror movie The Haunting and the Twilight Zone episode Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. And initially, I had it a little lower, but then I checked the dates and saw The Hungry Glass came out first. Like The Haunting, everyone in town thinks this house is haunted. But our four charming characters, the Thrashers and the Talmages, are making jokes about it. This creates some fun while you're waiting for the suspense to build, and it gives you a chance to like these characters. Liz Talmage thinks she sees something, but it's laughed off. But all the other ghost evidence is seen from Gil's point of view. Now, Gil was in the Korean War, and him and his wife aren't sure if it's the supernatural he's seeing, or if he's suffering from PTSD, or shell shock as they would have called it then and both of them are afraid to find out either way. Ever since we got to this house, my imagination has been working overtime, playing tricks. But listen, believe me, it's nothing compared to what I went through before, when I was really sick. When I was burning up with the fever, all my friends used to come and visit me. All my buddies from Korea. All the dead ones. I could see them playing. William Shatner's character's situation and his performance is similar to what he later did in the Twilight Zone episode. But because Thriller is an hour instead of a half hour, He's able to develop it even more here. As for the spooks, the house has this huge window where you can see the ocean and the clouds. And it's just eerie enough to what has atmosphere, but it's still something that normal people would believably buy. The main spirit was a woman named Laura Bellman who was so obsessed with her own beauty she spent her whole life looking in mirrors. Even when she grew old and ugly, she still only saw her young self in the mirrors. It's such a neat idea for a legend, and in today's world of people taking selfies all over the place, I think it's even more haunting today. When you see the ghosts, they're not scary looking, they're more ethereal, as if they're luring you in to the hungry glass. Ah, another familiar face for our number three, the Grim Reaper, and while you wait for it, the Grim Reaper waits for you. Popular crime author Beatrice Graves has bought the notorious painting The Grim Reaper. According to the curse, each owner of the painting has met with a violent death. Beatrice's nephew, Paul Graves, tries to convince his aunt to get rid of it, but secretly, he has his own sinister intentions. One of the fun things about looking back on Thriller and other shows like it is you get to see these iconic actors that you grew up with before they became icons, where they play completely different characters. And here we have Gilligan's Islands, Mrs. Lovery Hall, Natalie Schaefer as Beatrice Graves, and doo -doo 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 -doo, Star Trek's Captain Kirk, William Shatner as Paul Graves. When we first meet Beatrice, she's like a creepy version of Mrs. Howell. She's rich, a little flighty, and has a hearse sitting in her driveway. The hearse isn't it divine? <laughs> I just bought it. At first you think all she could do is be Mrs. Howell. But as her character becomes disturbed by the painting, you see what a deep actress she was. It's revealed that her character is an alcoholic, and she's afraid of losing her husband, and of getting old. That part parallels her own life a little because she was one of those actresses that always kept her real age a secret. In fact, even her closest friends had no idea how old she was until she died in 1991 at age 90. With William Shatner, it's the same thing. You're expecting Captain Kirk, and at first you get him. He's a good guy trying to save his aunt. But eventually it's revealed that he's a murderer, and when he's killing Beatrice's husband, he's calm and cool. It's so chilling. Along with the flesh and... <laughs> blood stars, there's also the painting itself, the Grim Reaper. First of all, it's spooky looking, especially the way they light it. In the opening scene, we find out that it has caused the artist to hang himself, so right away you get a sense of its power. It also bleeds every time the owner is about to die, which creates suspense and is a groovy gimmick. Now at the Graves' house, we learn more about its history, but as the show goes on, and William Shatner emerges as the villain. You start to wonder, is the painting really supernatural or is it just a fake out? That is until the end, when it goes after Shatner. <laughs> 
me out! Let me out! Let me out! You only see the blade once, but you hear it, and you see the fear in William Shatner's face, and you complete the rest in your imagination, and that's what makes it so creepy. The number two episode actually features actors from my own hometown. It is Pigeons from Hell, and as sure as my name is Boris Karloff, this is a thriller. Due to car trouble, two brothers, Timothy and Johnny, have to spend the night in a decrepit southern mansion. But they are not alone. A Zuvembi, or zombie, named Yula Lee is also in the house. Stephen King said that Pigeons from Hell and the I Kiss Your Shadow episode of the Bus Stop TV series were the two most terrifying hours of network television. And I think he's right. Pigeons takes place on a rundown southern plantation. The house was originally built for the 1927 version of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Universal used it in everything from Ridden on the Wind to Casper. On the outside, there's a swamp, we hear the sounds of animals, and there's a bunch of pigeons that practically attack Johnny. On the inside, it's dusty, there's a huge staircase, a portrait, and true to thriller form, shadowy lighting and eerie music. It's practically dripping with atmosphere. In typical thriller fashion, the story opens with the two guys having car trouble. But these guys are more like method actors when compared to the William Shatners and Natalie Schaefers. And Boris's intro is more serious too, so right away you get a sense that this episode is more realistic. While they're sleeping, Johnny rises, and in a trance-like state, walks up the stairs and Tim hears him scream. John? John? John! The dead Johnny is trying to kill his brother with an axe. It's so scary, because you assume Johnny, along with his brother, are going to be the main characters. Plus, it's shocking to see something so violent from early television. As the episode progresses, we learn that the Zuvembi caused this, and all these ordinary things take on a supernatural meaning. We learn that the pigeons mean that the Zuvembi is present, so whenever we hear or see them, we're filled with a sense of dread. And other ordinary things, like snakes, Diaries and skeletons absolutely generate this aura of evil. Every element in this episode is eerie. It's no wonder it has such a terrifying reputation. The number one episode is The Incredible Dr. Makasan, and as sure as my name is William Henry Pratt, this is a thriller. Fred Bancroft and his wife are broke, so they go to stay at his Uncle Conrad's house. However, his uncle, Dr. Conrad Markison, is actually dead, and through his own experiments, has turned himself into a zombie. This episode is the best at capturing the spirit of those old universal horror movies like Dracula and Frankenstein, while still bringing it in a new 1960s direction. Of course you have the old universal horror star, Boris Karloff, playing the spook. But you also have the old Universal Horror director, Robert Flory. Now, Flory was originally going to direct Frankenstein. He did a lot of preparation for it, but was ultimately replaced by James Whale. And instead, he directed Murders in the Rue Morgue with Bela Lugosi. And he does such creative work here with camera angles, lighting, and mood. Much of the story is an homage to Dracula and uses a lot of ideas that were unused in the Bela Lugosi movie. In the book, Jonathan Harker goes to stay at Dracula's decaying and cobweb-filled castle. After Dracula shows him his room, he warns him not to fall asleep in other parts of the castle, and even locks Harker's door. 
While Dr. Marcus San is a zombie and not a vampire, he also stays in his grave during the day. He issues Fred a similar warning about not leaving his room at night, and also locks his door from the outside. Above all, do not seek me out or disturb me for any reason whatsoever. One more condition and this is vital. I do not care to have you venture forth at night. You must stay in your rooms from dusk until dawn or leave the house entirely. Do you understand? Both Harker and Fred look out the window to see their captor leave the house. Just like that pest Jonathan Harker, Fred sneaks out of his room and spies on his uncle's horrific endeavors. And making those endeavors even more horrific is Boris Karloff himself as Dr. Markison. When he was 44, Boris Karloff played the monster in Universal's production of Frankenstein. He was billed just as question mark, but he became such a renowned horror star that Universal would later bill him as Karloff the Uncanny, or just Karloff. He played many great parts since, but the monster was his greatest movie role. Now at age 74, he's back at Universal Studios, doing his greatest TV horror role. He walks slowly, and there's something uncannily lifeless about him, just the way the living dead would be. And when he does show emotion, it has all the more power. I especially love this little smile that's equally charming and eerie. He's repulsive, but you also can't take your eyes off him. Making him and the other actors even creepier is the makeup. Jack Barron did the makeup for Thriller, and it's always spooktacular. And these zombies look like a precursor to Night of the Living Dead. They're not over the top at all. They absolutely look like a dead person decomposing. And because they're natural and subtle, they look all the more creepier. According to rumor, Alfred Hitchcock thought that Thriller was a little too similar to his own show, which was also on NBC at the time. So he threw his weight around and got it canceled. Well, it sure as my name is Bobby. I hope you enjoyed the top 10 episodes of Thriller.